Hello folks, my name is Josh Taylor and I'd like to welcome you to the 12th annual Telling Tales Festival and our first ever virtual gathering. Whether you are a veteran fan who has been to the festival or whether this is your very first time joining us, we are so happy to see how stories connect us, no matter how far apart we live. Speaking of where we live, the Telling Tales Festival happens in a place where people have lived and told stories for thousands of years. It is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, and the Neutral Peoples. Today, it is home to the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Six Nations of the Grand River, and to many other indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We recognize our responsibility to learn about their rich history so that we can better understand our roles as caretakers, neighbors, and friends. With a good heart and mind, we honor the sacred indigenous tradition of storytelling by presenting our program today. Miigwech, Nyawe, and thank you. Today, we are going to get writing tips from the masters in an episode we call Twists and Turns, moderated by the incomparable Kevin Sylvester. Be sure to watch the whole episode as Kevin is going to announce a really great contest where you can win a $50 gift card from an independent bookstore of your choice. A Telling Tales fan favorite and famous across Canada, Kevin is the award-winning author of over 30 books for kids, including Miners and Neil Flambe series. Kevin is a broadcaster, documentary filmmaker, and has a thing for monsters and other mutants, as we might discover today when he talks about his book, Hockey Super Six, The Puck Drops Here. Thank you very much, Josh. As Josh mentioned, my name is Kevin Sylvester, and I am the author and illustrator of a number of books. Uh, and a lot of them have plot twists in them. If you've ever read my Miners trilogy, uh, there are numerous plot twists in that one, including a kind of the ending of book one, which ticked off a lot of people. And well, to heck with them, they're just going to have to suck it up. Now, where I've joined, as you can see on the screen, I am joined by some of my friends to also talk about plot twists, twists and turns, and the way that we put together uh, a plotting. You can see Kenneth Opal is there. Uh, his uh, trilogy is well underway with the, the second book, I guess you're celebrating here at Telling Tales, right? Yeah, Hatch, second book yes. in the Bloom trilogy. Yeah, so Bloom and then Thrive coming out when? Next year, early next year? Yeah, May 2021. Awesome. Jonathan Oxier is here as well. Uh, you're here uh, with a new series that's just starting up. Will-O-Wisp is the first book. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, a lot of readers know me. I write these kind of older middle grade fantasies, and now I'm pivoting and writing something a little bit shorter. Um, I've got a new series. It's called The Fabled Stables, um, and this is the first in the series. Uh, each book, uh, this little boy named Augie runs these magical stables filled with one-of-a-kind beasts, and every once in a while, a new stall appears in the stable, and he has to go out into the wide world and rescue that strange marvelous creature um and so the first book is called will of the wisp um and it is the first in the series and they're going to be coming out every single season hopefully until i die <laughs> <laughs> which hopefully is for a long time we don't Three need that series. yes <laughs> no <laughs> spread them out spread them out no. And Syl Chang is the, uh, the other here person here on our panel. Syl, you are, of course, the, the author of the Cross-Up series for kids who love gaming. Uh, they're huge fans of those. They were up for a number of awards this year. Uh, welcome, and tell us a little bit about uh, the latest book that you've got as well. Hi, yeah, welcome, or uh, thank you for welcoming me. <laughs> I uh, write the Cross-Up series, as you just mentioned. The most recent book is Rising Star. That's the third book in the series. And this one has uh, Jaden going to Comic-Con in New York. So it's a little bit different um, in terms of the location. And there's lots of uh, twists and turns in there as well. Yeah. Excellent. D Ken, I, I sort of didn't give you a chance to describe your series. Do you want to just do that and then we'll, we'll launch in? <laughs> mean plants. <laughs> Terrible plants yes. that take over the planet. No one knows where they've come from. They're invasive. They are aggressive. They crowd out crops. They produce uh, terrible allergens um, and other things, acids that melt prey, including people. Um, 
seeds or venom coated seeds that are spat out by lilies. Um, so the first book bloom is basically uh, the first part of an invasion and hatch and thrive continue from there. And the heroes are three kids on Salt Spring Island, BC, who for some reason are immune to the worst qualities of these plants. So they become very important in the battle to uh, quell this invasion. Well, already I think anyone watching can see how there are lots of opportunities for twists and turns in any of those plots. Uh, Silva, I'm gonna go to you first. What, when you think of a plot twist, how would you define that? Like, I, I, how would you define that in terms of even your own writing? Um, so I think for me, a plot twist is something, like I want to say that you didn't see it coming, but then when it does come, it makes total sense. Like you, you're like, oh, why didn't I see that? That's so, that's how it should have been, right? It just totally fits. So when you look back, there were clues, but maybe not enough to give it away or hopefully not enough to give it away until you actually find out. So to me, that's at least a good plot twist, a good twist um so you feel like yeah like that obviously that's how it had to be and i just didn't see it coming um so that's my my take on a, a plot twist because if you see it coming i don't know that it's really a twist and then yeah if it doesn't fit then it feels like awkward it sort of breaks that wall between the reader and the and the book right exactly how hard is that for you to when you're plotting it out uh how hard is it for you to to to, to walk that line Oh, you're assuming I plot out my books. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Kids, we're revealing all the secrets right now. So I think I would consider myself what we kind of call in the writing world a pantser, which means that you, I, I write by the seat of my pants, at least when I'm starting. Um, there are, will come times in the process where I need to stop and really spend some time figuring out how to get out of the, all the holes I've dug myself into. <laughs> but, yeah. um, because of that, yeah, like I don't really plan out the twist. And that's the fun part for me, because a lot of times then that twist is something that surprised me too. And I'm like, yes, that's what it has to be. And I, it has to be that or else it won't work. But I hope I didn't see it coming. So how did the readers see it coming, right? So. Yeah. Well, I'm Jonathan again, you're both nodding. I'll, Jonathan, I'll just go to you next. Uh, when you're thinking about plotting and twists and stuff like that, what, what's going through your mind as a writer? Uh, well, Fabled Stable is a little more of a, a, a gentle adventure series. They're like 100 page, fully illustrated, almost like novel-like picture books. But my, my other books are very much really carefully plotted and uh, hopefully have a lot of pretty significant twists in them. Um, and I think Stove said something really uh, astute, which is, you know, I, I remember in graduate school, uh, my, my playwriting instructor had this great way of describing a good, a good twist, um, which is that when a twist happens, uh, the audience in the theater should do two things. Uh, they should go, oh, of course. And it's both of those things together. It has to be the absolute shock of what happened, but it must, must, must be followed by that recognition of it was there all along. And I think one of the things sometimes we forget, especially uh, for myself when I'm a new writer, is I sort of, you know, I'm so excited to think of something that no one could see coming that I just insert something that isn't organic to the story. But a good twist is shocking and inevitable. And so often, um, first of all, I often don't plot my twists. What I do is you can feel in a story when you're hungry for one. Uh, it's very similar to when I find places to in insert other emotions, humor, fear, things like that. I, I often don't plot out those parts. I, I just, as the story's going, I'm like, this needs a little bit of levity. So I got to find some humor in this moment. And then you take a step back and you look at all the things available to you, all the tools, all the elements you've already created. And so for me, I often, as I'm plotting, I'm like, I know I'm going to need a twist right about here, but I don't think of it ahead of time because then it won't really be organic. I just write the story all the way till I get to that point. And then um, I collapse into a black hole of anxiety for about three months. <laughs> my story will go nowhere and nothing makes sense. But I'm also obsessively looking at the clues that I've scattered in my own story kind of yeah. subconsciously. What are all the pieces? And the, the big thing that I think what a, what a good twist actually does, um, well, there, there are two things. First of all, a twist only works um, when it happens in the reader, not in the character. And I think sometimes 
uh, we have a character be surprised about something and but the reader wasn't surprised and those are usually really unsatisfying yeah twists. and we've read these we've seen these in movies where it's like the character is really oh my goodness this person's my father and you're like yes we know <laughs> <laughs> we knew that a year, four minutes ago yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. uh so that that's not a twist that's something else um but the other part of it i think that's that's really important is um a great twist a twist has basically a perfect negation of a fact that the reader maybe the character but certainly the reader has taken for granted so take you know one of the greatest twists of all time in the movie Sixth Sense, which is a super old movie, so I'm going to spoil it. Yeah, super, super, yeah, supposedly everybody's seen it by now. Yeah, and if you haven't, I'm going to ruin it for you, and it's still a very good and watchable movie. Uh, your main character, you learn, it, he's he's dealing with a boy who sees ghosts, who's been traumatized by it, and we learn he's like a therapist, and we learn uh, pretty late in the story uh, that he's also a ghost, <laughs> and he's haunting this boy as well. Yeah. Um, what's the premise <laughs> we took for granted? That our protagonist was alive. It's a perfect negation. And I find the best twists basically negate so many little hidden assumptions. The character we thought was a hero is actually a villain. Um, the space miners who thought they randomly encountered a, a space beacon in the movie Aliens actually were sent there specifically on this quest. Yeah. Whatever you as the reader took for granted, just perfectly inverting those, uh, it's so satisfying. Um, because it, it basically, it's like sleight of hand, right? You were looking at this hand, but this is the hand that was picking your pocket. Misdirection. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ken, uh, just, uh, I want to ask you a separate question first, but did you have anything to add about, like, so both Silv and Jonathan say that they sort of organically reach these twists. You're a big plotter, though. Like, I do, am. You, do you have those twists in your head before you sit down and do the writing? Some of them. I mean, yeah, I'm so relieved. I don't think of all the things that, Jonathan very well articulated while I'm writing or else I'd be incapacitated feeling like I had this playbook that I was supposed to be you know, cognizant of the whole time. I, I, I would be just completely overwhelmed by that. Um, to take a different tack though, I, I was gonna say, um, because I spend so much time uh, before I write this story, uh, plotting and outlining, um, and that process sort of uh, demands that you consider every possible direction you know, the plot might take at any given moment, you know, until your head is at risk of exploding. Um, by the time I make my decisions, um, you know, I've thought about everything very carefully. And it's a miracle to me that anyone could possibly be surprised <laughs> by, by anything that happens in my books, just because to me, it seemed like so patently obvious that it had to be this way. So I think writers, you can give yourselves a little bit of slack because the wonderful thing that happens when a reader is reading the book is they are locked into the clock of your story. And they have not had the time to consider all the all the possibilities and all the stereotypes and all the you know the other the other things that may or may not happen. Um, so your reader is just right there with you. You know it's unfolding in front of them like a movie. Um, so I think the inclination is is more often than not to be surprised. Perhaps you're not going to get that you know earth shattering gasp and of course moment. Um, those are kind of special twists. I mean. I think of twists as you know something that might happen once or twice in a in a in a novel, but yeah. uh, more often than not, you know you you're 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 confronted with decisions that your characters have to make regularly throughout the story, um, and those I don't call those twists. I call those like, you know decisions or um, or the character you know coming up against adversity and seeing someone solve a problem. Um, so maybe it's just a question of you know how we label these things. Um, but a twist to me is like, you know, that's kind of a special sort of like a magical trick that you can sort of pull out of your, pull out of your top hat. I'm back to introduce Krista McNaughton, a terrific actress and comedian here to show us how we can brainstorm a few elements of a story through a technique called improv. Hello everybody, my name is Krista and I'm here to teach you a few basics of improv. Improv is a form of theater where nothing is planned. You don't need to learn any lines and you create your own scene using your imagination and a few simple rules. The first rule is called yes and. So any ideas your partner says, you accept it and add on to it. For example, if my scene partner says, We're astronauts. 
And we've just landed on the moon. Then I might say, yes, this is great. But it looks like it's made out of cheese. I love cheese. And then we might continue the scene being astronauts eating the moon. It's good cheese. It is. <laughs> Another important thing to know is that you are creating the scene out of nothing except for suggestions that you get from the audience. You're at a baseball game and it's starting to rain. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Swing, bada bada bada, swing, bada bada. Oh no! Oh no! My corn dog! This means you have to imagine the setting and the props. You'll have to act out the scene while miming. Now, miming is more than just being stuck in a box. It's everything from making a phone call, hello, or climbing a mountain. Now this may all seem a little silly, but you can do anything in improv, and you can practice at home. Think of your favorite activities and pretend that you're doing them. Maybe you're throwing and catching a ball, petting a dog, anything you can think of, and the more detail you put in, the better. A fun game to play at home is called Build a Room. It's very simple. Walk into a room by opening a door. Maybe it's push, maybe it's pull, or maybe it's really heavy. Now once you walk into the room, you're going to create an object. Can you guess what this is? That's right, it's a hat. Now, when you're done with your object, put it away and leave the room through the door. You can play this with a friend. They can walk into the room, put on your hat, and then create another object. And you can keep taking turns for as long as you want. This can be a lot to learn all at once. Just remember to always take your partner's ideas. Your actions are just as important as your words. And the number one thing that you should never ever forget, have fun. It's supposed to be fun. Don't be afraid to act a little silly or make mistakes because it's all part of learning and that's the best part. So be kind to your scene partner, they're learning too, and have fun. See you next time. Thanks Krista. We're going to take this opportunity and challenge you to develop your own original plot incorporating the elements we discussed. Submit your outline to the Telling Tales website contest page and you will have a chance to win a $50 gift certificate from your favorite independent bookstore anywhere in Canada. Telling Tales will do a draw from among the participants and three winners will be announced during our next spooky writing workshop, Scare Me, on October 22nd. Now, one of our friends from the Hamilton Children's Choir is going to show us how we could use our voices to create sound effects to set the mood for our suspenseful plot lines. Hello, my name is Zinfira Polos and I am an artistic director of the Hamilton Children's Choir. The human voice can be a storyteller. I will use only my voice, not even the words, to create a dinosaur. Dinosaur has a rounded, small head, and it's very high. Ooh! A long neck. Ooh! A huge body. Ooh! Let's do this together. legs. Oh, let's add this. Ooh, back legs. Ooh, and even tail. Uh, wow. So one more time.
What about your dinosaur? Tell me a story about your dinosaur. Index finger in the air. Let's try to do this together. Beautiful. Your dinosaur even more bigger than mine. Amazing! Cool vocal demonstrations. Thank you very much, Hamilton Children's Choir. And before I let you all go, uh, we're obviously, this is the Telling Tales Festival. It's designed for kids. A lot of the kids who come to this festival really want to be writers. Can I get each of you, I'll start with you, Syl, can I get each of you to sort of maybe even give kids some advice if they're having trouble working out plots? And you're a teacher as well. You, you must get asked these questions all the time by the kids in your class. Yeah, well, I teach core French right now, so we're not writing quite that complicated of a story yet. <laughs> but Fair yeah, when I talk to students in, in the hallway and they say they've read my book and we talk about plot, for sure, they talk, talk about how they want to become writers. It's very, very common conversation. I, am, I wish that it's something that I could say you can teach. I feel like to a certain degree, the best thing that anyone can do to become a better writer is to read. So read as many stories as you can. And I think a lot of what your brain will do then is kind of internalize uh, story structure, right? Internalize um, how stories are put together. And in a way, when it's time to write, you end up kind of just automatically knowing that at least you'll know when something's not working. <laughs> you can try to figure it out. For me, I think I think it was Jonathan who said, you know, sometimes you spend months pondering what has to happen next. Um, I know that that happens to me. There have been times where, you know, it's uh, long walks with the dog where suddenly you have that, oh, 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 I think I've got it. And you weren't even thinking about, <laughs> about your story at the time, but something happens or you hear a clip on the radio that um, mentions some obscure story that happened and you're like oh that would work for my story <laughs> you know and it often will just come from a, a random place so I think the main thing is to make sure that the the twist that you put in there does make sense based on the character um, like we've said um, it has to make sense based on what we know about that person that they would actually behave that way that you know in that story world that kind of choice makes some type of logical sense um, and that it fits kind of for the reader so the reader will feel satisfied. I know my kids are constantly talking now about they like to watch videos on YouTube that because they're satisfying. I feel like an ending has to be satisfying, you know. Um, if it's if it's not, it's maybe just not not quite ready yet. Not not the exact exact ending that you're looking for. But yeah, honestly, I think um, read, 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 read. And when you're done, read a little bit more and it will definitely help your, your writing. Awesome, Jonathan? Well, I think Sylv's on to something that so many of these rhythms we're talking about are ones that we intuit um, and they, uh, it's, it's not as helpful to, I mean, I can talk story craft all day, if you couldn't tell. Um, it's my favorite subject to discuss. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the real intuitions are ones that come from reading. Um, I will say, because it's working right now, my, so my daughter, she's eight years old and, and over quarantine, just in the last couple of days, she's uh, wanted to start writing a story. Uh, and she has trouble writing quickly, can't type. So basically, I just, uh, you know, um, I just transcribe word for word everything she tells me. And we do these half hour sessions where she's writing a chapter of what's turning into be into a novel and I, I it's not perfect but I will say that if I finished with a draft that looked like this I would definitely try to make someone publish it um <laughs> uh so I don't know if she if she's gonna get there um and but I will tell you the the things that I'm not trying to steer her I want this to be her thing but I, I will say the I guess the three uh principles um that we're proceeding with because I think they would be helpful for anyone um the first is I didn't, uh, I wouldn't do this with her until she agreed in very formal and, and serious terms that once we begin it, she will finish it. Um, she, like lots of people, like myself, um, gets an idea, gets very excited at the beginning and then kind of fizzles out 
and the best thing you can do is actually get to the end because so much of what writing is is finishing a bad version or an imperfect version looking at it seeing now you understand what you actually want to do and kind of reverse engineering and going back <laughs> and making it a little better so she, we have to write to the end um the second thing is before i will sit down with her um and the reason we can do it in a 30 minute session is i make her spend the whole day prior thinking about it thinking about what she wants to say and the specific things i ask her to think about um for each new chapter is i want her to think about two events and by event i mean something that can't be taken back right something that occurs that changes everything around a person and their situation. So I brushed my teeth is not an event, but uh, I brushed my teeth and accidentally uh, gouged it through my cheek. Uh, <laughs> weird, but that would be an event. It would change everything because that's the day you get a toothbrush through your cheek. Um, yeah. It's just something that changes things. And then I'm my suggestion is always thinking in um, contrasts. So in each chapter, come up with an event that is exciting and moves that character toward where they're trying to go. And then think of something that is bad that gets in the way of where they want to go. Um, and they can mix up the order that those hit, but that's also to keep that vacillation because I think what Ken if it was talking about um, in terms of we, we love that variation. Um, so those are some very simple pr premises, finish, the whole thing, think about each chapter before you write it, and then alternate some good and bad for that for that variation. Um, those are some very, very simple principles that I still apply when I sit down to write a book, uh, you know, 15 years into this career. Cool, and Ken, last word to you. Man, um, your kid's never gonna become a writer, Jonathan. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you terrify her so much. This is, this is like, oh, I can't believe this. I mean, when, especially when I'm writing a first draft, I, I, I have to just like, like not be analytical, you know, because I, if I felt like I was going to test every scene as I wrote it, it would, it would crush me. I feel like kids, um, my inclination is to tell kids like, uh, just write and don't worry about, you know, what it is you're writing um, or if it's terrible. I find as, the write, as a writer <laughs> to this day, the biggest hurdle I face in my day-to-day -day life is is getting myself to a place where I write. And I'm not constantly editing as I write. I'm not worried about the repercussions of what I write. I know that it's gonna be probably kind of rotten. Maybe, maybe it won't be, but chances are it's gonna be rewritten. It's gonna be rethought, but I've got to write it because A, I'm moving forward and B, sometimes you need to write the terrible thing or the not ideal thing to realize um, that it doesn't work. And that's very informative. Even if you spend a whole day writing a scene that doesn't work, you know it doesn't work and you'll try something different. Um, so I, I just, I encourage kids just to, to write and not worry about all the pieces being in place. If the characters are flat, my characters are flat as a pancake, you know, in my early drafts. And that's why you go back. I mean, and that's another um, hurdle for kids is they don't want to rewrite usually. Yeah. It's just so hard. It's hard to write. And by the time you're done writing a draft, you think, well, that's, that's that. <laughs> it's done. I'm not going back to that thing. Are you crazy? Um, but I mean, the kids who want to write will will go back and they'll and they'll think about it. So sometimes it's good to make mistakes. I would say make a mistake. You know, like take take an unexpected uh, reaction. Make someone behave in a way that you didn't think they'd behave, and see if it if it works. And if it doesn't work, ask why, um, and then think of think of a different way. I think it's great too, though. That the all three had slightly different messaging, which I think is good for kids to hear too. That there's not one way that any author writes. We all kind of end up finding our own path, right? The one, can I add one thing? I am going to add one thing, which is one thing I discovered is that if I sit down and start writing on my computer, I never finish. So I always start off with a notebook. Ooh. And for me, I do, maybe it's because I'm an old man, which I am, but that tactile feeling of plotting something out in a notebook first, I actually try to plot out almost the entire chapter by chapter action of my books now. Uh, and I you know, if I, if it's a really good book, what I do is I, I, I put it in my Spider-Man notebooks. <laughs> but that's, I, yeah. I always have this handy, you know, this is my, I have so many of these, you know, I'm just like, you We're know. doing this now, hang on. Yeah, Over that's how we go. Room. <laughs> Phil, run, run, grab it, grab it. But you're just, you're, yeah. It's so fun to look at. Oh, look, look, it's, it's bubbles. <laughs> awesome. Well, I, you know what? I'll, I will share one thing that I do with mine. 
which is that when I'm plotting, I always write the plot on this side and I leave this side blank. Oh yeah. Unless something pops up. There we go. Yeah. Unless something pops into my head that they would be saying or that they would be maybe dressed like or look like or what the action would be. This is plot. This becomes texture. So yeah. that when I sit down and start writing the actual book, I'm sort of writing, writing, writing based on this side and then looking over here and going, oh, I already said what they're going to say in that scene. I find that super helpful. What is the inside of your, uh, the open yours up, so let's see. So mine is when I have problems. So, or when I'm doing research. So like if I, like video game world, this is not the one from that. This is from our current YouTuber uh, thing I'm working on, but um, yeah, like when I went to video game tournaments, I had my notebook and I'm writing down all those little details that may or may not be needed later so that when I do get to that scene when they're at the tournament, I can make it authentic and look for, okay, what were people wearing? I want to make sure that I have that. What, what was the temperature like in the room? What were um, the sounds that I heard, right? What kind of um, vocabulary and jargon was I hearing? So I use it for the research and then I use it when I get stuck. So usually I write to that muddled middle yeah. Sometimes I make it even further into like the the two thirds and I just don't know what's that you know you need that climax part of your story and I don't know if I'm going in the right direction and then I just start okay and it's just random like it could go this way or it could go this way or what if this happened right so it's to figure out yeah when I'm when I'm stuck then I need my notebook yeah absolutely but when I'm just playing I'm doing my hour at night of getting some plot down, I, I always use the computer. So interesting that we all have yeah. for somewhat different reasons. A lifesaver, lifesaver. For sure. So yeah, that my... was tip children, get a notebook, <laughs> dollar ama, dollar store. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Uh, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thanks to all three of you for joining us today. Sorry we can't be outside at Telling Tales with the wind rustling in the trees, but I hope that everybody got a kick out of this. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks, everyone. So now it is time for you to sketch out your own original plot. We've given you all sorts of ideas on how to do that. And I'm going to give you a writing prompt. How about this? There's a pizza shop that opens up at the end of your street. But it's not like any pizza shop you've ever visited before. When you go in and take a bite of, let's say, a Hawaiian pizza, one bite takes you to Hawaii but 100 years ago. Two bites and you're back 200 years ago, like you eat really fat. What happens if you go back so far in time that you end up in a place that can't have pizza or doesn't have pizza? You'd kind of have to invent it, I guess. Now, that's just one idea that is not an idea that you need to hold on to. Uh, you don't have to use it. You could ad lib your own darn thing. You could, you could take something you like, take something that you find interesting, cats, dogs, and make them magical or slightly weird or slightly different. So my idea is just one idea that could help you get writing. Uh, once you have your twisty, turny plot outline, submit it to the contest page on the Telling Tales website. Uh, you might win a $50 gift certificate from your favorite independent bookstore. And if fame is what you're looking for, well, you know what? You could submit it to our creativity club on the Telling Tales website. You'd have to sort of flesh out that plot into a full story to submit it, but you don't know who might read it. And you don't know who might go, hey, that might be a great book. So, get ready. Have fun. Thanks for joining us. And remember to visit our website for more events and to upload your artwork, your writing, your videos, and your ideas to the Telling Tales Creativity Club. Telling Tales is all about the joy of discovering how stories connect us. Tell us what you thought of this episode by filling out the survey on the Telling Tales website and you could win a book from one of today's authors. See you again.